uh, advance us the time so we can stay on uh, task with the, with the program. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you to the Minokan Farm. Uh, we certainly appreciate you coming here. Uh, my, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Daryl Oswald. Uh, I just manage the Minokan Farm. And uh, just a little bit about the Minokan Farm, if some of you haven't been here or you've heard about it, uh, we're a conservation demonstration farm. And uh, it's 150 acres. And uh, our focus here uh, at the farm is uh, long-term soil monitoring, uh, using the soil health principles as our guide, and uh, moving forward to to, you know, raise crops and uh, gardening as well. Uh, we have cattle here at the Minokan farm as well because one of the soil health principles is livestock, right? And so the, the Soil Conservation District owns our own livestock at certain times of the year and we use those in our demonstrations. And uh, so we're a regular operating farm. Uh, I, your focus here, I believe, uh, with the clever name, UCOW, I really like that, by the way. Uh, commending Ryan for that name. And then, of course, he told me it was really Kelly to come up with it. So he, uh, you know, it's all really have to commend her. But, uh, uh, your focus here, of course, is urban conservation. And a few years back, uh, the Burley Soil District, in conjunction with the Minokan Farm, uh, we started to put an emphasis on urban conservation. Some of the districts that you come from have been doing this for quite some time, right? Uh, and, and so uh, it's out on the radar, and it's definitely needed. Regenerative agriculture, the soil health principles, can apply on two square feet or 10 square miles. And so the principles remain the same. And, and so as you go through the next day, day and a half, uh, and tomorrow when we, we look at some of the things that we have going here at the Minokan Farm and other places, uh, you'll see those types of scenarios take place. I think it's really important, and, and I commend you all for, for, of course, for being here participating in something like this, if you already have a concert urban conservation program or you you in the process of starting one, I think it's vitally important, right? This COVID thing that we had and that's been going on for quite some time, I can't even remember when it started, to be honest with you, has changed the things in the fact that I think from the food side, food has become somewhat important whether it's how it's made, who's making it, uh, what have you. And, and so I think as an agency, whether it's the federal side or the conservation district side, I think now is a good time to strike while the iron is hot, you know, for lack of a better term. And I think that there's lots to be learned, and I think that we can make a difference. And obviously that's you think that as well because you're with us here today. Uh, again, I'd like to welcome you here. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Uh, I'll keep it relatively short. Uh, Jaden and others have, have done a good job putting the program together. Uh, Talking a little bit about our high tunnel and some of the produce that we raise here at the Minokan Farm. We have the outdoor garden as well as the indoor garden and a rain garden and some other things that we'll look at. Our first, uh, <coughs> first presenter today is Mark Meyer from Heaven's Helper uh, Soup Cafe. Cafe. And uh, Mark is a recipient of some of the, the, the produce that we have here at the Minokan Farm. And, of uh, he, course, he's very grateful for that, and, and as I told him earlier, we're very uh, grateful for 
the opportunity to help serve him because, or serve uh, his mission because he, he really uh, has something special going on and, and that's why he's with us here this afternoon. So with that, I'll keep it short. Please help me welcome Mark Meyer. Thank you. All right, so I'll, I'll speak right here so you can kind of see some of the, the photos as we go along. Um, so uh, the Heaven's Helper Soup Cafe started in, in March of 2019 at the old Hawks Pit Stop location. And uh, it was small. Now, this is the, the dining room area. So the whole soup kitchen is as big as or was as big as the kitchen that we cook in now. If you include the bathrooms on the other side, the square footage, it's the same. That was my office, a booth. <laughs> Go ahead. And so then after six years of being at the, the soup cafe uh, at the Hawks Pit Stop location, we end up losing our lease and we are homeless for about two and a half years. And um, uh, then we got the old Cheswick Seed building. Maybe some of you have been uh, to Cheswick Seed over the years. But uh, this is our, our kitchen right now of where we serve the food. And that was in, in uh, 2017 that we uh, closed on the, the building and, and started. So go ahead. So this just kind of shows you the old um, Cheswick Seed. And uh, go ahead. Uh, what, what it looked like before we started renovating. Mouse ridden, we made a lot of mice homeless um, in the process. You can imagine um, in the back here they stored all the seeds um, and the mice kind of lived in the insulation. They'd get up in the morning and say, oh, I wonder what's for breakfast, you know, and so um, we had to clear it, clean all that out, rip up a lot of cr concrete flooring and different things like that. So it was a whole big process to get the, the soup cafe up and running. This is looking out the, our kitchen. This is in the, the back area. We, uh, this is putting up the, the walk-in cooler and the walk-in freezer. Um, then we started on the ministry center so um, we go through a lot of volunteers at the Soup Cafe to be able to, to do what we do. Um, we serve probably on average, it used to be about 200 folks a day. Um, we've seen because of, I think, the, the higher costs and uh, between food and gas and everything like that, we've been seeing about a 25 to 30% increase in people who come to the soup cafe um, over last year. And the, the soup cafe, um, go ahead. So this is the back ministry center area, go ahead. Kind of shows you the different um, pictures there. We, we repainted it and changed a lot of different things. So, so that's the the outside of the, the Heaven's Helper Soup Cafe, but a lot of people think it's just for people who are homeless, um, when in actuality our probably numbers are probably in that 15 to 20% would be homeless, and the rest are gonna be uh, working poor, uh, elderly. We've got people who um, uh, might be veterans or families with kids, that sort of thing, who come to the soup cafe. Um, go ahead. The back ministry area. So you can see we've done a lot of work to Cheswick Seed to get it to where it's at. We've got a baptismal um, in there because um, this is the dining room. Uh, what's unique about the soup cafe is that it's set up like a, a cafe instead of a soup kitchen, you know, where you go through a line and they 
slap the food down this you're able to to just go through and and seat yourself and we wait on people with love and respect and they will get uh, well we, we always have at least two homemade soups a day a couple sandwich choices a day salads desserts drinks um, like a like a restaurant really but everything's free of charge go ahead this is the serving window where we serve things for the people waiting on tables We have a lot of fun there. That would be an example. Uh, you can see our lobster stew, tomato soup, beef mushroom ravioli soup, sub sandwich, and a surprise sandwich. So, always something, something interesting. Um, one, <clears throat> once in a while, we, when it gets towards the holidays, uh, we're making pumpkin soup here. And it tastes kind of like a pumpkin pie. And then we take the bread pullets, um, cinnamon logs, and cut it up and, and toast them and uh, serve it like that. So not many soup kitchens have the luxury of having lobster bisque or lobster. Um, but we, one of the things that we do is we stop at different restaurants every week. We stop at Red Lobster. We stop at... Um, Olive Garden, uh, where else, uh, Longhorn, um, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. So every week, and so we just kind of save up the lobster and make that when, uh, when we get enough stored up. So everything's homemade. Sometimes the beans get carried away. You know, a lot of times we don't have to open up one canned uh, vegetable or, or beans. You know, we we, uh, we make try to make everything from scratch, and that's what it looked like before we redid everything. A lot of times we'll have people perform out in the dining room and sing and different things like that. Let's go to number two. So, um, <clears throat> a lot of people wonder where we get our food from, our support from. We don't get government funding, so whatever the good Lord provides, that's what we cook with. Um, so we have local donors who will come by, like, for example, this was uh, uh, around Christmas time where someone made a, a Christmas tree out of canned goods. And it was a company here in town, and then they donated to the, to the cafe. And uh, we do use canned vegetables in the wintertime when we kind of run out of our, our supply. But individuals come in. They had made some fried bread at home, so we, uh, we serve fried bread with our meals. Um, fresh eggs come in um, from farmers, and uh, we make egg salad sandwiches. We make uh, um, hard-boiled eggs that we serve around as salads every day. Fresh vegetables, obviously, yep. Yeah. Uh, meat comes in. Um, Again, we um, can't remember if I just mentioned this or not, but we haven't went grocery shopping um, since '09. So when meat comes in, um, we uh, I'll, I'll talk about what we do with anything excess that we don't use for our soups and sandwiches every day. But this was an elk that was uh, harvested by the uh, veterans out in the in the Badlands. So that was a blessing. Um, we get a lot from Great Plains Food Bank. Um, who goes to Walmart and Sam's Club and different places like that. Strawberries. Um, does anybody follow us on Facebook at all? You might want to follow us on Facebook. Um, we, we will uh, get a pallet of strawberries like you see here, and, and then we'll announce, hey, you know, if you want to... I mean, it's either use or lose. You know, it's not just for 
someone who can't afford it, but it's to share that blessing with the, with the whole, whole community. So there we were giving away a pallet of strawberries. Different varieties of vegetables, mangoes, um, all kinds of stuff. So it's fun because we can make fresh salads, you know, um, all the time and fruit and different things like that. Uh, dairy that happened to be cottage cheese when it came in. Uh, a trucker um, had, I forget how many pounds of of bananas over a hundred thousand pounds of organic green bananas and whoever it was going to they found one bug on it and they refused the order and so they had to get rid of all these bananas so um we end up getting i think two or three pickup loads of bananas that we just uh pass out to the community um financial support comes from uh, individuals it comes from companies this was a, a fundraiser uh, one of the credit unions um, had for us um, other groups um, uh, this was a, a biker group that had a, a, a calendar made and 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 that was a fundraiser um, just different things like that A um, lot of fresh garden produce, especially this time of year, like today's soup. Um, I had creamy tomato soup with um, a lot of our tomatoes. Didn't have to do anything there. Um, some, some of you might know this girl, <laughs> Ginny. Um, what else do we make today? I made pigs outside the blanket soup, and I didn't use one canned vegetable. You know, we used peppers, and we used... Uh, tomatoes and fresh cabbage and hamburger and different stuff like that so <clears throat> we try to be very good stewards of everything that we have um, this is a cow what we call our cow bin um, when uh, go ahead this is a that was a high school student that um, built that for us so when we get um, bagels that are stale and bread and vegetables and when we trim up and peel our vegetables all all of that goes in containers and we put it in the cow bin and then it goes to a local farmer here his name is Dwight Ruther and uh, he feeds feeds it to his cows and so these are just photos of his cows enjoying the the surplus And then he donates um, usually about one beef a year back to us. And uh, other people he sells beef to, a lot of times they don't um, want their soup bones, so we get their soup bones. Um, of course, we recycle all the, the garbage, but um, just just being good stewards of all the the old stuff you know helps us to not fill up our dumpster otherwise instead of once a week we'd probably have to have it twice a week uh, so um, garbage bags um, we we get them from uh, the Lando lakes you know on 12th street there they've got big bags and then we uh, take them back and trim them up and fold them and that's what we use for garbage bags so I don't think uh, we've ever bought a, a garbage bag since we started in 2009 either. So we usually can about once a, once a week and you can see the process here. Um, we uh, good activity for our volunteers they cut up the meat we put the spices in um, we've got the all-american 941 two of them so um, you can can uh, up to 21 jars in each one so 42 quarts 
um, in one in one canning session. So you can really pack the the jars. We give a lot of volunteers some skills that they've never learned before, from butchering to uh, to canning. Um, during COVID, um, we even had a farmer who couldn't get rid of his hogs, and he donated two hogs to us. And so, you can see you can see the process that we we did with uh, with the hogs. So. We, uh, we can that. Those would be the two uh, pressure canners that we have. Like I say, 21 quarts a piece for those. And then when they're, when they're done, they'll last 15 to 20 years on the shelf. We do freeze drying. So these things run 24 seven. We had two of them. Someone just bought us a third one. And so um, we freeze dry, um, like I say, 24 seven. And so what I've been doing mainly is um, chicken and ground beef and steak and different proteins or cheese. Cheese freeze dries really well. Um, anywhere from mozzarella to cheddar to Parmesan, um, we freeze it in there. The whole process takes about 55 hours from when you put it in and it freezes it and then vacuums it and dries it. Um, and then we put them in uh, silver mylar bags with an oxygen pack and that will, um, that will store about 25 years is what they advertise on TV and stuff like that on the shelf. So we can continually rotate our freezers and uh, use fresh stuff and um, not have to worry about it between canning and freeze drying. Um, we're prepared for any lean times when donations don't come in. This one here, you can see we've got two things of cheese and two things of two trays of beef. And these are tubs that we store the freeze dried stuff until, until uh, a couple of volunteers come in and that's the process that they put them in the Mylar bags and we put them away. Dehydrating. We, we dehydrate mostly vegetables when we can. So we've got uh, two or three dehydrators going quite often. And then we package them up in mylar bags also. So what's nice is that we're able to, um, we're able to use all this fresh stuff ourselves. And then these are the shelves that we have in the front that we offer to folks who can't afford it. And it would be um, anywhere from bread to vegetables to fruit to um, excess dairy, you know, different things like that. So even though we're not a food pantry, um, a lot of people utilize us um, for that that purpose. Look at all that fresh squash. And so we try to we try to strike that balance between what we can process and what we can um, preserve to what we need to give away um, and use for for our soups. Corn on the cob. And all these are you see here are all volunteers because you know we're probably 
about 30 volunteers every day just to be able to run the Heaven's Helper Soup Cafe. Those are some of those green bananas I was telling you about, those organic bananas. So. So <clears throat> what you're seeing here is um, what we make the soup in. Um, I affectionately call her Fat Sally. She's a 30 gallon tilting skillet. So you can see this is a, a situation where, um, you know, we got a call from the butcher shop that they had a bunch of uh, soup bones. And so we fill it up with soup bones um, and put water right towards the top and we let it simmer usually i make make it over the weekend we'll we'll do it saturday about noon and let it just slow simmer where it's just barely bubbling and then monday morning we will um, take all the broth and take the meat off the bones and have wonderful healthy um, bone broth for for our our guests We've got another one right beside it now. Um, his name is Husky Hank. He's a 40 gallon uh, tilting skillet. So we can make 40 gallons at a time or we can use it to make grilled cheese or uh, different hot sandwiches. And that's what we use Husky Hank for. We also make broth in it. Um, I'll mainly use that in the winter time just because of the amount of heat that is given off um, Husky Hank is gas, whereas um, Fat Sally, she's uh, electric, so it doesn't quite give off as much heat. So, but you can see that's a big, big batch of a uh, broth. <laughs> and here's the process. These are some folks who live in the Hazen area and donated, uh, you know, a bunch of meat. So that's what the broth looks like when it's done. Very beautiful. And, and when you compare this broth to the store-bought, I mean, there's just no comparison. This is like concentrated, so. And we use, like I say, uh, Fat Sally, she cooking soup every day. Chicken, beef, different things like that. Vegetables, that's all mushrooms there. Hamburger. <clears throat> What's nice is you're able to fry up 100 pounds of hamburger and then tilt it kind of scoot it all towards the top, tilt it, and then all the fat drains down. You can just easily skim it off. So, Even quesadillas. Borscht. So this was our record pre-COVID, 417 in one day. And uh, it's a lot of, a lot of people. Mark, can I ask something? Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, as you can see by the video. It's um, my wife, Mary. <laughs> um, there are a variety of people that come in. And the kids love it because they learn to job. They can do spray off the... Um, spray all the dishes in the corner, corner dish, and, and or they can sit down. Like say there's somebody that doesn't want to serve in the dining room, they can sit down and cut veggies or what have you. So if the cool thing I think is cool is that the volunteers, they just, there's something for everybody, no matter what they want to do. And they don't have to be out in front if they're shy or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's beautiful just seeing the volunteers having fun and coming at the group. So. I just wanted to share that with you. Mm -hmm. Somebody that's like, oh, I can't stay on for a long time. So it's just really cool. Yep. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. So you say there's about, I think it's about 30 volunteers a day. Yep. How many different people, I mean, are there in hundreds that come? I mean, obviously, they'll do the same 30. 
You know, um, I, I I would say over over the course of a year, and I just I just figured this out, and um, I would say there's over over 500 to 800 somewhere in there different people. I mean, we've got our regulars, but you know, we've got companies that you know their employees trade off every Tuesday. They come at a certain time or youth groups or 4-H, different things like that. Um, yeah, a lot of people. And COVID, you know, um, just to let you know how COVID kind of affected us, um, that 417 was a record pre-COVID. And then when they shut down the dining rooms with COVID, um, we started serving through the window and then our record went up to around, right around 540. I don't remember the exact number, but 540 meals a day. And we were um, giving them generous portions because they couldn't come back for seconds. And so um, kind of funny, once, once we reopened back up after COVID, our numbers just really dropped. You know, we never did hit that 417 again. Um, partly because people were nervous to go places. A lot of the elderly were, were staying home. Um, we lost a lot of our volunteer base. That was uh, a challenging time, but we're uh, recovering. Um, our high post COVID is um, about 350 now. Um, so yeah, it's just changed since, since COVID. But you can see here, this is, uh, this is when we were dehydrating um, onions. You know, a lot of times we get the onions when, let's say they need to be used and used fast. So we, uh, we have uh, big groups and we do stuff like that. Making soup. Let's, let's back up one, one if we can. So that's Big Bertha. That's our seven gallon soup pot that we used to use as our largest one at the old soup cafe. And so um, now it's our, you know, when we want to make a small batch, we use Big Bertha. So it's fun when the family can come and let the, the kids serve and have them as big of a part as they want to want to have. Um, as Mary was saying, you know, even people who have impaired, you know, whatever, um, they can sit down and, and chop. We get, um, I think this was like a first or second grade class from one of the schools, have different projects for them. Um, we have volunteers who have uh, a bigger skill set, like an electrician, you know, he volunteered all his time in our in our remodeling um, all all these guys are volunteers uh, this gentleman passed away a little over a year ago um, Lyle yeah. and he was 90 90 some years old and he'd come uh, twice a week to chop vegetables and loved it Yep. He'd walk down, do his stuff, walk home. He'd go home with a few goodies that he liked. And yep. He was just a very sweet gentleman. Yep. Even, even when you got little ones. <laughs> um, this happened to be a, a gentleman who was uh, struggling with addiction and uh, his. Mom came to the old cafe and asked us to pray for her son. And lo and behold, when we started up the, the new cafe, he came to help out. He's clean and, and uh, laid all that brick for us in the baptismal. So a lot of good stories. This was a Boy Scout who, uh, um, his Eagle Scout project built a, a shed on the uh, uh, west end of our building and was a blessing for us there. More vegetables. 
Um, we have volunteers who uh, do um, not the, the cleanest job, but Deuce is Wild. They suck out the, our grease traps. And so that collects all of our grease, you know, when we wash the dishes and different things like that. Sucks it all out and uh, they come about once a quarter. Um, we usually have, when we have a, a, a little bigger group, um, when we make Nephla soup, we don't buy the store-bought ones. It's all homemade Nephla, so these kids are making Nephla. They need it. They cut it up and get it all ready for soup. We even have uh, volunteers who um, at home make Nephla for us. It's so, a ladies group who 10 of them get together and visit and make Nephla for us. So Never too young to cook. <laughs> Those were the croutons that we put on the, the pumpkin, pumpkin soup. Uh, this is uh, Becky and Todd. They come with a group from, uh, from uh, mm, I'll think of it in a little bit, but one, one, of, the, one of the companies who, um, uh, and they, they make soup, or excuse me, they make sandwiches for us three three days a week. So they all come and and uh, community uh, community yeah. options community options. I think I think it's community options. And so they come with a group of about six people, and they all chip in and they make sandwiches for for the day for us. So works out really well. that oh that was just a picture of soup cafe bucks um, when we started the the back part um, people can earn a shower they can earn laundry tokens or computer and uh, they volunteer for an hour and they can use the shower the laundry the computer that sort of thing So we serve a Christmas meal um, every year. Um, we usually are closed during Thanksgiving because there's other places that serve a community meal. Uh, Christmas time, everything's closed. So we try to put on a, a, a real special meal. Um, uh, we've had steak, we've had walleye. This is, this is a time where we had a lot of steaks that um, were donated and uh, um, anywhere from uh, tomahawk ribeye to porterhouse to New York strip. And so we season them all up. Walleye from a fishing tournament. It's my son Matt and uh, um, another volunteer grilling the steaks. So really, you know, they people feel very special during that time. We uh, seat people back in the ministry center until their table is called, and it's presents for the kids during that time. Um, Perkins usually donates pies during that time, so they get some nice pies, and. Like I say, it's just a, a nice sit-down meal and a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> we've expanded since we first started. We, we started Closet 701, the Heaven's Helper Closet 701, which gives away free clothing uh, in the community. It's, it's uh, um, set up as almost like a boutique it's not doesn't look like a thrift store because it's not everybody can uh, get free clothing when they come in and uh, 
And these are just a few pictures of that. So people have opportunities to, to get free clothing in the community who, who need it. Um, the last, um, we also started the Heaven's Helpers repurpose store and that's Matt, our son, and uh, he manages the place. And basically what it's for is it's a, a thrift store of sorts for building materials, appliances, furniture, bigger stuff. And um, we're in the process of trying to, to open our doors. We're open online, but we're going through some city stuff that we need to do before we open. We're, we're hoping in October. And... Uh, and uh, you'll notice this is kind of when we first started. It's a big warehouse. You'll see a lot of empty shelves and empty spaces. And then we slowly started to fill it up with donations, trying to keep stuff out of the landfill, you know, where we have good usable stuff that we can sell to, uh, to the public. And uh, in turn, what that's designed to do is um, we hire people who maybe have felonies, who've had struggles um, coming out of addiction where we can get them back on track and mentor them and stuff like that. So this is closer to what it looks like now. A lot of nice furniture, um, lots of lots of stuff, air conditioners, and appliances, and things like that. I think that's done. So, um, so in conclusion, um, you know, really, it's it's something that the community can get involved with, whether they're donating um, goods or helping with volunteer. Um, we just try to be the hands and feet of Jesus um, each and every day. We try to be good stewards with what the Lord provides, and uh, it really works out well because. The, the whole community has an opportunity to, to share in this experience. Um, I'll open it up for any questions anybody has. So what, on average, how many people come to do so, <clears throat> so, so number one, since COVID, instead of staying open till seven, we only stay open till five. So we're, we're closed two hours earlier. And, um, uh, what I would say is, I, I used to say right around 200, but we're like last week, it's not even the end of the month. See, the end of the month, people start running out of money, food stamps, um, different things like that. And so it gets busier from middle to the end. And so like our slowest day last week was um, like 210 and uh, our busiest was 280. Um, yesterday we did 260. Today we'll probably be around that area. So it's just, it's just climbing. It's climbing. What are your hours, Mark? So our hours now are 11 in the morning till five at night or five in the afternoon. And so people can come and go. We serve all day long. We don't have a lunch special and a dinner special. It's, you know, we run the two soups or three soups like we are today. And then if we run out of one, then it's two soups and go till the end of the day. When you freeze-dried pan and all that, that's used this to be specifically to be used later for your soup? Yep. Okay. And, and, and so far, um, we've been blessed enough to be able to have enough to not have to worry about it, but... Um, a lot of people don't think lean times uh, uh, can happen, but they're coming. The Lord has shown me that, and so we're just trying to be good stewards. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your time.